In this video, we're going to look at electrolysis and electrolytic cells. This is section 20.9 in your book. So as you're looking through electrolysis, if you have questions, refer back to 20.9. That will definitely help you. So we're going to start by reviewing voltaic cells and comparing them to electrolytic. So remember that voltaic cells are spontaneous. It uses a spontaneous chemical reaction to drive current through a wire, right? drives electrons through a wire. And then you can actually use the energy that's given off to do electrical work, create electricity. Batteries are discussed in 20.7 and corrosion is discussed in 20.8. Make sure that you read those two sections because we're not going to cover those in detail, but you still need to know the material in those two sections. So make sure you read 20.7 and 20.8. You can add any extra information to your notes and then definitely bring in questions to me. Now the difference between voltaic and electrolytic is that electrolytic cells do not occur spontaneously. So it's a cell that actually uses electricity in order to pull electrons through a wire. So it's almost the opposite of a voltaic cell. The voltaic cell is a battery. Electrolytic cell needs a battery in order to work. Electrolytic cells are the cells that are typically used to separate metal ores. So you can actually separate a metal or to plate out metals. Electroplating is the example of electrolytic cells where you actually need a battery in order for silver to plate onto a cheap metal. So this is a general electrolytic cell. You have the anode, which is still where oxidation occurs. You have the cathode, which is still where reduction occurs. But notice you have a battery. Instead of just a voltmeter or a light bulb, this actually has to be a battery. The electrons still go from the anode to the cathode. Here's the anode, here's the cathode. But notice that the battery has its own anode and cathode. Anode, the anode electrode is negative. So it's going to be attracted to the positive terminal of the battery. The cathode electrode is positive, so it's going to be attracted to the negative side of the battery. So the cathode and anode of the battery just make sure that the positive one matches to the negative, the negative matches to the positive. With the electrolytic cell, generally you have two inert electrodes, so maybe platinum or graphite. You have two inert electrodes that are immersed into either a molten which means it was melted, or into a solution. Electrolytic cells are in a single container, so we no longer have two separate containers. And then this battery acts as the electron pump. So what this battery is doing is it's pulling electrons from the anode, and then it's putting them onto the cathode. So it's pushing the electrons from one direction to another. So here we're going to look at electrolysis of molten NaCl. So we're going to be looking at molten compared to aqueous NaCl. This would be what an ideal electrolytic cell would look like. So you have two inert electrodes. You have the anode and the cathode. Remember, the anions are attracted to the anode. The cations are attracted to the cathode. You have a battery, which is pulling electrons from the anode to the cathode. Now, with this electrolytic cell, you need a source of direct current, which is a battery. Okay, so you need a source of direct current, and it's connected to the two inert electrodes that's immersed in the molten NaCl solution. So this is probably at a very, very high temperature because you had to melt down solid sodium chloride into liquid. But because the salt has been heated, okay, now you have ions because it's melted. So you have some ions in the solution now. So you have Na plus going toward the cathode, Cl minus going toward the anode. Notice that reduction still occurs at the cathode, oxidation still occurs at the anode, and when there is no water present, okay, so if you have a pure molten ionic compound, the cation will be reduced, the anion will be oxidized. So what's the difference between uh, this cell and the voltaic cell? Well, similarities include the electrons flowing from the anode to the cathode, reduction occurring at the cathode, and oxidation occurring at the anode, and then some differences are that you have to have an external source of energy. This does not happen on its own because it's non-spontaneous. You need a source of energy, and that's the battery. Overall, the cell reaction is non-spontaneous. That's why we need the battery. And instead of using a salt bridge, we actually use a semi-permeable membrane. That's what this dotted line is. So semi-permeable means some things can get through, some things can't. When sodium ions collide with the electrode, the battery, the whole purpose of the battery is it has enough potential, it has enough energy 
to force the sodium ion to pick up electron to form sodium metal. Because remember, it does not want to do that naturally. So the battery actually causes this half reaction to occur. And this occurs at the cathode. The Cl minus ions, again, the Cl minus ions now will be oxidized to Cl2 gas. And that's why you saw those bubbles, because it's going to bubble off. So this occurs at the anode. Now notice that the cathode is negative, the anode is positive in electrolytic cells. I don't want you to worry about the sign of the electrodes for electrolytic cells. Don't worry about one being positive and one being negative. I only want you to know the signs of the electrodes for voltaic cells. But you still need to know where the cathode is, where the anode is. So the effect of passing a current through molten NaCl is that it decomposes NaCl into its elements. Okay, this is the very first reaction that you probably ever learned was decomposition. So this suffix lysis, because we, I talked about electrolysis. Lysis comes from the Greek root to loosen or to split up. So electrolysis literally means you're using electricity to split up a compound. So when we pass an electric current through NaCl, we split it up into its ions. Just like when you split an electric current through water, you're splitting it up into its ions. So the electrolysis of NaCl actually gives us uh, liquid sodium, right, because you don't actually see it plating at all. So you get liquid sodium and chlorine gas. So the potential, so the cell potential that is required to oxidize Cl minus to Cl2 is negative 1.36 volts. The potential needed to reduce Na plus ions is negative 2.71. Where can we find these numbers? Appendix E. So it's negative 2.71 right off of Appendix E because we're reducing. If we want to oxidize Cl minus to Cl2, we have to flip the sign and we get negative 1.36 volts. So the overall cell potential of this electrolytic cell is negative 4.07 volts. This is very non-spontaneous. So the battery that's used to drive this reaction needs at least 4.07 volts. That's why normally we use a 9 volt battery because it has 9 volts of potential that it can give. So if we use a 9 volt battery, we usually have enough voltage to run an electrolytic cell. So another common example of electrolysis, like I said, is the electrolysis of water. This shows the setup. This is actually how we can collect hydrogen and oxygen gas is simply by connecting it to a 9 volt battery. You have an electrode in the water and then you create oxygen gas and you create hydrogen gas. So now we're going to look at the electrolysis of aqueous NaCl. Right? So now there's a difference. Now instead of having molten, we have aqueous NaCl. So this figure shows the ideal cell in which aqueous NaCl is uh, electrolyzed. So if water is present and you have an aqueous solution of NaCl, what we have to do is we have to figure out if the ions that are reacting are the ions or if it's the water. Okay, so again, we have to figure out if what is reacting is the ions from the ionic compound or the water. Okay, and what we do is we look at the reduction potential table to figure it out. As a general rule of thumb, no group 1 or group 2 metals will be reduced in aqueous solution. And I'll say that again. No group 1 or group 2 metals will be reduced in aqueous solutions. Instead, water will be reduced. That's what we see right here. We see water being reduced at the cathode to H2 gas. And then the other rule of thumb is that no polyatomic ion will be oxidized in aqueous solution. Water would be oxidized instead. So we're going to actually look at why this cell works the way that it does, why water actually becomes reduced and then chlorine still becomes oxidized. So there are two substances that could be reduced at the cathode. We could have Na plus ions or we could have water molecules because remember this is aqueous. In aqueous solution means it's dissolved in water. So we could have either Na plus or H2O being reduced. So what we have to do is we have to look at possible reactions at the cathode. That would be Na plus going to Na or H2O <clears throat> going to H2 and OH minus. These are directly off of the uh, reduction potential table, the exact half reactions. So looking at these two values, one is way more negative than the other one. Well, the one that is less negative, the one that is more positive is the one that wants to be reduced, okay? which means that's going to be water. 
Water is more positive, so if the reduction potential is more positive, it wants to be reduced. So in this case, the water is actually the one that is going to be reduced. And then there are two substances that can be oxidized at the anode. We can have Cl- ions and we can have water molecules. So let's look at the possible anode reactions, possible oxidation. We have Cl- going to Cl2, and here's the value. Notice that the sign is flipped because this half reaction is flipped from appendix E. Or we can have water oxidizing to O2. Now you might say, well, Miss Carney, how do I know whether it's H2O going to H2 or H2O going to O2? Well, look at the oxidation numbers. Figure out what's happening with oxidation numbers. In this case, you have the oxygen going from minus 2 to 0. That's oxidation. So this oxidation is uh, negative 1.23 volts. So now we have to think about oxidation. Well, you could leave this as reduction potential and you could compare those values. But we're going to compare, we're going to compare these numbers. So the more positive one is the one that is preferred because now we're looking at oxidation. So the more positive value here is the one that's going to be preferred. Or look at the reduction potential. The one that's more negative is the one that is preferred. But in reality, so oxygen is slightly, slightly more preferred. So the water is slightly more preferred than the chlorine. But in reality, the product is Cl2, and we saw that in the cell. So why does this happen? Why? Well, there's one exception to the rule that we need to know. Thermodynamically, we would expect the water to oxidize, and it does. It does oxidize, but it does so slowly compared to oxidation of chloride ions. And since their cell potentials are so close, in most reactions, the battery provides enough voltage to carry out both reactions, but because the rates of reactions are so different, then you're actually going to see chlorine gas being produced. And this is called over over voltage and over voltage is just caused by um, the difference in reaction rate so over voltage is the extra voltage that has to be applied to a reaction to get it to occur at the rate at which we want so again over voltage is just that extra voltage that we need to apply to get a reaction to occur at the rate that we want so in this case the Cl minus ions being oxidized occurs at a faster rate so that small overvoltage is definitely worth it because water takes so long to oxidize. Also, under ideal conditions, probably standard conditions, the potential of 1.23 volts is large enough to oxidize the water to O2. Under real conditions, it can take a much larger voltage to initiate this reaction because it's so slow. The overvoltage for oxidation of water can be as much as 1 volt, which means that we would need 2.23 volts for that to occur. So because overvoltage, or I should say we have overvoltage, uh, it cannot be predicted. Okay, We don't know when we have overvoltage, how much overvoltage we need. That would make everything much more complicated. So the overvoltage for uh, the formation of metal ions or atoms is usually really small compared to overvoltage for nonmetals like gas molecules. So really the only exception that you need to know is this overvoltage for water and that water takes a really long time to oxidize. So then by carefully choosing the conditions at which we operate the electrolytic cell, we can make sure that chlorine is the only thing that is produced in this reaction. Now in uh, the industry, electrolysis of aqueous NaCl is very important because chlorine, hydrogen, and sodium hydroxide are all in high demand in the chemical industry. And chlorine, hydrogen, and sodium hydroxide are the products of the electrolysis of aqueous NaCl. If the membrane is removed in the cell, so if we remove that semi-permeable membrane, the products of the electrolysis will actually form sodium hypochlorite, which is actually the first step in the preparation of bleach. So the reason that I'm telling you these two uh, important facts is because this just shows you that electrolysis is very important. Electrolysis plays a huge role in the chemical industry with allowing us to have a lot of the chemicals that we do. This is why sodium hydroxide is pretty inexpensive for us to purchase. This is how hydrogen gas can be formed. This is, how, this is why, why bleach is so cheap, because sodium hypochlorite is very easy to form. So in summary, the electrolysis of aqueous NaCl and molten NaCl are not the same. In molten NaCl, when you have something that's molten, that's much, much easier for us to do because all we're doing is we are simply decomposing it into its atoms, not ions, but its atoms. 
So NaCl liquid will be um, decomposing into sodium liquid and chlorine gas. However, aqueous NaCl, we have NaCl plus H2O, we're actually going to be forming Na plus, OH minus, H2, and Cl2. So notice that the products are definitely quite different for the electrolysis of molten NaCl versus aqueous NaCl. And again, if you have any questions on this, please make sure that you read 20.9 in your book. You should be reading that either way um, because, again, that's going to provide you with extra figures, extra pictures, and just extra information on electrolysis. Also, make sure you have any questions, write them in your notes, and bring them to class.